Greetings, welcome to the Workers' Rights Institute's webinar series on movement lawyering and the solidarity economy. I am Mark Gaston Pierce, Executive Director of the, work, of the Georgetown Law School's Workers' Rights Institute, WRI for short. The Black Labor and Solidarity Economy Series is an effort sponsored by WRI to host several conversations designed to creatively reimagine the future of Black labor in the United States, centering on opportunities for building the solidarity economy. What is that? The solidarity economy is an alternative framework to economic development and systematic transformation grounded on the following principles, social solidarity, cooperation and shared power, equity and justice, pluralism through many paths, sustainability and participatory democracy. In February, we hosted a very informative inaugural discussion on worker cooperative lawyering Today, we are graced with a dynamic panel of Professor Carmen Huertas Noble and Julian Hill. They will, will be discussing worker cooperatives, movement lawyering, and alternative institutions. On a technical note, live captioning is available. This event is being recorded and a captioned version will be available on WRI's YouTube channel shortly. Please submit all questions for panelists in the Q&A box. There will be a Q&A time towards the conclusion of the panel, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. All technical logistical questions can go in the chat box. Now for our panelists. Professor Carmen Huertas Noble is founding director of the Community and Economic Development Clinic at CUNY School of Law and a 2020 Cooperative Hall of Fame inductee. She has played a leading role in providing transactional legal support to worker-owned cooperatives in New York with research and scholarship focusing on promoting alternative ownership models, including community land trust and worker-owned cooperatives, as well as other alternative institutions. Her scholarship emphasizes the role of lawyers in creating meaningful client participatory decision-making processes as part of the lawyer's counseling process and in support of client-centered lawyering on behalf of alternative institutions. Julian Hill is an abolitionist, solidarity economy lawyer, organizer, educator, and artist a clinical teaching fellow with Georgetown Law's Social Enterprise and not Nonprofit Law Clinic. Julian formerly served as a supervisory attorney with Take Root Justice in New York City, where he advised dozens of worker cooperatives on a host of matters. He is founder of the soon-to-be worker cooperative, Yohablo, which uses hip hop to teach Spanish. We will be starting with a presentation from Professor Huerta's Mobiles, then a discussion between she and Julian Hill, followed by questions and answers. Friends, faculty, students and workers, and all who advocate for pu the public interest, I present Professor Carmen Huerta's Nobles and Julian Hill. Thank you, Mark, for that introduction. And thank you for everyone who's in attendance. And I also would be remiss if I didn't thank the Georgetown Workers' Rights Institute, as well as Adi Salam and Julian for inviting me to be part of this series. I'm really excited to discuss movement lawyering, the solidarity economy, and alternative institutions. Before discussing movement lawyering, I understand that some of us may be steeped in the literature and the practice practices around movement lawyering and other us, others of us may be new to the concept. So I am going to incorporate the definition of the concepts in my remarks and also give examples. And of course, 
after this, we'll be in conversation with Julian, which I'm really looking forward to, as well as Q&A with those who are on the webinar. The movement Law for Black Lives uses the term movement lawyering to distinguish the why, the for, and with whom we do our lawyering and we do our work as lawyers. Movement lawyering is a kind of lawyering that's near and dear to me, mostly because I see it as a form of liberation lawyering and all of our liberation is bound together. But also because it centers black, indigenous and people of color and other marginalized communities that are most directly impacted by the unjust systems that operate under the law. So that is the why behind doing the work. In terms of with whom we do our work, movement lawyering is a lawyering approach that uses the law to build power of various social justice movements, housing movements, worker co-op movements, community land trust movements, LGBTQ movements. The point is to work with and engage with activists and organizers and communities on the ground in a way that helps them build out their vision of what they want to see in communities and really centers them and communities and decenters lawyers. Um, lawyers are used to leading, but sometimes it's good for us to follow and implement people's vision. So again, we are here to help and we are not here to lead. We work with organizers and communities to bring about transformative change with the goal of having the largest ripple effect for the most people directly impacted. Movement lawyering, lawyering is also about engaging with communities in a way that helps build and support the solidarity economy, which Mark spoke about. And just, I just wanna underscore that is not based on capital, but solidarity and humans helping each other and putting people over profit. It seeks to create alternative institutions to support communities, collective empowerment, and the creation of transformative systems, such as community land trusts, credit unions, public banks, mutual aid societies, and worker cooperatives. There are many alternative institutions that people are working on creating to address the many ills that we face under capitalism. Worker co cooperatives is one of them, as an example of a transformative alternative enterprise owned and governed by its workers. This means workers earn an equitable share of the profit and they dem democratically control their workplace. Worker co-ops are not meant to replicate the status quo. It's not about just creating more owners, which can be a laudable effort in and of itself. But worker co-ops are really trying to be more transformative and be an alternative to the capitalist model. It's labor that gives people the buy-in and it's not just a in financial investment. And it's usually governed by one worker, one vote. So that is the democracy part, economic democracy. Really trying to honor labor over capital. One of the largest um, worker co-ops that also happens to be a unionized worker co-op is Cooperative Home Care Associate, which is in the Bronx. And we are seeing a resurgence of co-ops um, in New York City and also in many states across the US. In New York City, the resurgence of co-ops were cat catalyzed by successfully organizing the municipal support. So a couple of years ago, a number of organizations, nonprofits got together and wrote a policy report regarding whether co-ops could be a vehicle to uplift people out of poverty. And as part of that process, we wrote the policy report, we had a policy press release, we had a hearing with city council, and we had two city council women really take on and champion the cause. And since then, New York City has, I believe, invested approximately $18 million um, into building out the ecosystem for worker cooperatives. So it's just not about the creation of worker co-ops themselves, but also making sure that there's an ecosystem to support them in formation and to support them in sustaining their growth. There's also a growing state support in which there's more and more legislation to create access to technical support for worker co-ops in New York City, as well as access to funding. And now that we're looking at the scale and wanting to think more about how to scale worker co-ops, we are also working with community members 
that are using an anchor institution approach. The anchor institution approach is using institutions like hospitals and universities that are very unlikely to get up, to pick up and move or relocate as a way to anchor the wealth within the community. I have my client's permission to talk about the, the matter that I'm gonna talk about right now. And I will talk a little bit about my community and economic development clinic that is engaged with this work. And one of our clients was the coalition to save Interface. Interfaith is a medical center in Brooklyn. Later, the coalition would change its name to the Coalition to Transform Interfaith. Basically, Interfaith was being slated to close. So the community got together, unions, 1199, the nurses union, community residents, faith-based institutions got together to prevent the closing of the medical center. And once they successfully did that, they decided, why stop here? Let's actually transform the medical center. The original goal was to have the medical center itself become a worker cooperative. But as many lawyers on the call will know, medical centers are highly regulated. So it's definitely a long-term goal. So in the interim, what they decided to do as their approach was to cooperatize the supply chain to the hospital. And two union co-ops are being formed in order to do that. One is a union co-op that the hydroponic farming and would provide the cafeteria of the different medical centers with produce and also homebound patients. The other is a union co-op that is forming to create and build um, hospital furniture that would source the hospitals. So these are two approaches and two union co-op businesses that are being created as part of the initial plan to cooperatize the supply chain to the medical centers. It's important that is the anchor institution understanding that the, not only about creating wealth, or in the hospital sense, it's not only about creating health, but it's also about creating wealth in the community. So within this model, the dollars stay within the community and circulate within the community. And that is one of the major benefits. The other thing that the group is thinking about is how to, how to address the social determinants of health. So they are also looking at housing, in addition to healthy food, looking at housing, and also thinking about if you're from New York, if you're not from New York, in Brooklyn, the medical centers have a lot of land, which is kind of unheard of in New York City, right? Or we're very dense. But the medical centers actually have a significant amount of land. And as part of their um, initiative, is looking to use that land to create cooperative housing as well and a community land trust. So these are people who are very visionary and are willing to do the work to get this model off the ground. And then just in case you're wondering, I know for some people, they haven't heard of co-ops or the, uh, they think co-ops are a niche and aren't that successful, but there are plenty of successful co-ops, including Land of Lakes, Ace Hardware, Florida, Florida's Natural Orange Juice, but those are really producer co-ops. But again, we are seeing a resurgence of worker co-ops in New York City that we're excited about. We're also seeing them in places like Denver with the Taxi Cab Co-op and many other places, especially in California. So the idea is to think about how do we support as movement lawyers, clients who are part of the solidarity economy and are looking to create alternative institutions and perhaps looking to create these institutions without enough of an opportunity to get funding to do so. So this is where the solidarity economy also really comes into play and is important because credit unions and public banks are likely to be more willing to take the risk to actually fund these initiatives. And also working with um, foundations to also have them understand what is a worker co-op and why it is a good investment and it's worth the risk in terms of taking and um, funding these projects. I think with more and more worker co-ops being formed, people are seeing this as a viable um, option, and it is. And lawyers in doing this work, you know, we're seeing that 
This is not a case where you have one client um, or one person representing the client. You are working in coalition and that can make things, um, it could feel a little more, it could feel a little bit more messy at times because democracy is messy. Um, but at the same time, having more stakeholders at the table means that the generative outcome usually takes into account things that some people may have overlooked and is more inclusive. And, and in that sense, I think it's worth the, it's worth exploring new approaches of, to lawyering in order to tap into that knowledge base and create the vision that communities want to see in their neighborhood. So on that note, I will, I will stop and let um, Julian ask questions and we'll be in discussion and then we'll do Q&A. Hey, Julian. Hey, Carmen, good to see you. Thank you so much for, for your remarks. And you know, I'm always appreciative of just the way you do the work. Um, you were the first person to introduce me to this work. And so I'm feeling particularly privileged to be in this conversation with you. And so I wanted to, to start on one of the last threads that you were talking about, which is around working with community and really centering community and sort of ask you, and this might be some, somewhat of a, a, an obvious question, but how do you define and identify a community that you work with as a movement lawyer? Or how have you, how have you done it in your practice um, traditionally? Yeah. Well, for me, traditionally, I think for some, um, I haven't usually referred to myself as a movement lawyer, but I have worked with a lot of movements and lawyered with a lot of movements. And I, I guess kind of organically practice in that way. And um, I'm sorry, Julian, what was, I lost the question. Yeah, just like, how do you, how do you identify the community that you're working with? Uh, how do you so, define, yeah. yeah. So we do that in our intake process. And what we do is really try to find, if they're already formed, um, nonprofit organizations that are working with organizers. We always want to work with organizing groups because we believe that working with organizing groups, our mission is aligned and usually organizing groups are making sure that they're bringing in the most people that they can in order to um, push an agenda forward. So in terms of deciding who to work with, we look, with, we look to work with folks who are organizing on the ground. We also we have the luxury because we're a law school of also looking for folks who are very visionary and where, you know, if they had to pay for an attorney, it would be of course prohibitive. Um, and we are kind of willing to strategize and um, be a partner in that process if the client wants that. So we definitely try to make sure that we are accountable to community, especially when we're working with intermediaries by making sure that the intermediary is organizing and working with the communities and, and myself personally, and with always with the permission of the client, attend client meetings, attend their, their events, um, even if there is no legal part to it, just to get to know people as people and for them to get to know me and my colleagues as people and cultivate the relationship. So that's, that's basically how we decide to um, how we, how we decide to take on movement lawyering work. Yeah, no, that's, that's, that's interesting. And I think there are a lot of parallels in, in how, how I've approached it. I found that a lot of the organizers doing this work are, you know, in communities that are, you know, underserved, that are, you know, on the margins and, you know, the folks who at least in my experience, have tended to work with have a desire to really build power among those communities, as you kind of mentioned in your remarks. And so, um, so I want to I want to tie I want to talk a little bit deeper on this thread. And you kind of start to talk about it in terms of creating relationships. What does what does accountability look like within the context of your relationships with community? How do you how do you keep yourself? you know, accountable in the work and doing it in a way that is really centering the community members that you're, that you're working with? Um, 
I try to be as transparent as possible in my wiring um, from the beginning and throughout in terms of where the where the wiring choice points are and ident identifying that for the client. So it doesn't seem like a choice that I made is actually based on the law when it's based on my professional judgment. Um, and being very transparent with community groups about that is a way to remain accountable and check in both with the leaders and the members of the organization. And I, I've also found like there are times when organizers will arrange for a potluck lunch or something like that um, and attending those things. And I think people feel very comfortable in a relaxed setting to say, you know, maybe what you did two weeks ago wasn't the best approach. We could talk about it and, and do it differently. Um, so in a relaxed setting, I think people are more willing to kind of call you in because sometimes the work becomes so overwhelming in terms of just the amount that even if you want to be transparent, you might get so focused that you forget to kind of check in with the client. Um, so then for me, I have like a tickler system, the way litigators have a tickler system to remind me to check in with the client. Um, because early on in practice, that was one of my experiences where the client was like, well, that was great that you were doing all that work, but we weren't aware of it. So, you know, learning from our mistakes and then incorporating them and making sure they become part of our practice, I think is, you know, a natural form of lawyering um, and a good form of lawyering. Yeah, awesome. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that. And, you know, it's definitely something that I know you're teaching your students in the clinic and definitely something that we, we talked about around being very client-centered. Um, I want to uh, touch on this approach, you know, movement lawyering in connection with some of the coalition work that you that you do and have done. So you had mentioned earlier, you were working with this coalition in New York City that was really trying to figure out how to get more support for like a larger worker cooperative ecosystem. And so in those kind of contexts where there's no like quote unquote client and there's sort of organizations, community leaders who are you know, advocating for, um, for change really and, and trying to do it in ways that are transformative. How does that approach map on within that context in terms of the community, in terms of accountability? I think when, there's, when there isn't a client um, and you're part of the strategizing and community work, it's important to mainly listen so you can get a sense of what the community wants. Um, I think once, once it kind of moves from the planning stage into the implementation stage, usually um, a client entity has been formed because what we want to make sure that we do is to be able to help, to be able to hold ourselves accountable, right? If there's no client, then it's so easy to you, like just plug in my own opinion and say, this is how we're going to go. But if yes. there's a client, I know, I know better, right? <laughs> and, and there are professional rules of responsibility that stops us from doing that. Um, but sometimes clients can see that as different. It's not about, a, it's not a CYA move for me. It's more about, this is how I'm gonna keep myself accountable and this is how you're gonna keep me accountable. So the group can be as large as the 15 people who are on the coalition, but it will just be more structured and it'll be clear that the lawyers don't get the final say, the client gets the final say. And then they get to determine how they wanna shape uh, entity that will be the client. Yeah, and having those conversations early <laughs> are just like so, so important. I think, as you mentioned earlier, in a traditional company where you've got one boss and nine employees, there's not much conflict in terms of decisions when it's like one of one person, right? But when you're working with cooperatives where you got more cooks in the kitchen, quote unquote, you know, you really have to think through how people are working through conflict. I think, you know, foregrounding those conversations is, is so important. And again, as you mentioned, like the lawyers really sort of being actively voicing the idea that they're sort of in a supportive role um, is, is, is important. And as someone who does organizing work, and in that context has worked with lawyers, it's something I've, <laughs> I've grown to appreciate. So, um, so thank you for speaking to that and into, into embodying that. So you, you kind of, in that answer, you talked a little bit about 
just like other people who might who might be involved. And sometimes it's other lawyers, right? So you might not be the only lawyer in the coalition. And so I wanted to know, you know, how do you assess um, and respond to the ways in which like power shows up? Um, and this could be both in terms of you and how you assess, and you talked a little bit about this before, but also like other lawyers and, you know, their relationships with the communities that are really interested in engaging um, in this work, because it can get messy, as you mentioned. And it's not like a client and there are like other lawyers. And so I, I would love to, to get your thoughts, your wisdom on that, since you've done that work much longer than I have. I think, thank you, Julian. Um, I'm always conscious about power and power dynamics. And I, I think that when it's co-counsel, there have been times where co-counsel is really useful and helpful, but not necessarily mission aligned. And, and sometimes when we're at the table, we decide that we're gonna chop up the work where we will be client facing and they will not be client facing. Um, and will handle a matter that the client isn't necessarily interested in having input in. For example, like um, negotiating the commercial lease, as opposed to coming up with their governance documents, that's where we will be more closely, um, we would be the person that, that the client interacts with the most. And also kind of, you know, we pull each other's coats sometimes to say, you know, to, to lawyers and to our colleagues to remember our, our place at the table and um, to give space for clients and community. And our job is really, to, is we are there to support and help, right? Um, we're so glad, I think it was maybe it was five years ago or maybe even more when the ABA changed the rules that clients don't only get to tell you what their goals are, but they get to inform how you get to their goals. Um, so that's another way of kind of keeping myself accountable and keeping my colleagues accountable as well. And then there's sometimes, you know, this work, a lot of times people are doing it on top of full time work. They're doing it on the weekends. And sometimes lawyers, um, you know, we, we have high pressure jobs, can lose patience. Um, and sometimes it's about reminding that because we're operating in a system that doesn't automatically support and we don't automatically have the funding that it's gonna take longer and that that's okay. Um, because with a, especially with a lot of the big projects, those tend to take a couple of years. So you have to keep people interested and engaged. Um, and usually the community stays interested and engaged and sometimes co-counsel a little less so. And that is not a knock on co-counsel because if, if your case load is like this high, <laughs> you know, and you're like, okay, this is not really moving along you might put it to the bottom, but there needs to be someone that's like, no, 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 don't put it at the bottom yet. Here's where we are and to keep the group together and keep the group moving. And then in terms of like, and then there will be conflicts too. And I think mm -hmm. for a lot of lawyers, once a conflict arises, they wanna step back and out of it. It's like, once you fix the conflict, we'll come back. Um, and I really think that just depends on who you are as a lawyer, what your skill set is. Um, you may be able to mediate that situation. You may be able to um, create consensus building through collaborative counseling. There can be other ways in which you help a group. I'm usually inclined to try to find a mediator, but if I cannot find a mediator, then it is a role that I'm willing to step into with the permission of all the people concerned, especially if it means like the conflict will result in a lost opportunity such as funding or the project being stalled. So many, so many thoughts <laughs> I have. I mean, just thinking about co-counseling and yeah, just the way in which there's like an inherent almost power dynamic sometimes there, right? Because when I think about co-counsel, oftentimes it's, you know, a law firm more or less in, in most instances, right? And there's a lot of assumptions that come in around the idea like we have these resources, we have this experience, and kind of having those conversations can 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 be tough. And so I'm, I'm glad you were you, you know you kind of kind of named that. And so for any folks on here who work at law firms, have people who work at law firms and want to co-counsel, you know don't don't be a pain in that way. Really really listen to um, the folks who who have the experience and who are really grounded in doing the work with community. And obviously listen to a community that you're going to be working with. 
So I have a related question. And this is a really important topic for me because I've been thinking about it a lot in the past, I don't know, like maybe three or four months, but it's about political education. And so I would love to know, how do you approach political education, uh, particularly when it comes, like you being an educator, when it comes to legal practitioners? So whether it's in the co-counsel context, in the context of your students, and you know, how do you approach it with the communities that you work with? And, and finally, because there's a lot of elements to this question, what's your own personal approach to study? Uh, how do you make sure that you're thinking things through and doing the reflecting and sharpening your, um, your analysis? So. I think there's, yeah. um, there's definitely, there's many, but this is definitely a benefit of being um, a law professor and that we have the opportunity. And I should just tell you that the, the CUNY clinic um, model is one in which, at least mine, is one semester and it's for 12 credits. So it's really intense model and it gives us a lot of room to explore theoretical perspectives, which basically is us doing political, political education for the students to make sure that they understand the context in which their client is having a problem with it or their client is trying to change. So we do a lot of, we do focus on theoretical perspective throughout the entire course. Um, usually, we, when I was saying earlier about really actively listening, even in the intake to get a sense of, people will always tell you their goals, but to really kind of explore with them what their underlying interests are and why they have those goals. And a lot of times you'll get the political education from them. Um, and that's hard and that's something that we teach um, very intentionally because it's hard for, for lawyers, for most lawyers to be in a room and be quiet for a long time, right? I mean, there are studies that say we usually interrupt our client within the first two minutes. So it's, it's really about listening to the client, getting an understanding of where they're coming from in terms of the political education. Every year, like for some folks, they say, well, you know, how hard can it be to teach? You teach the same classes every year. And I'm like, I might teach some of the same topics, but I don't teach the same class every year. Because every year something comes up, there's something that new that's going on in a movement, and we try to incorporate that. And we also, because I don't teach alone, I say we, we also every year kind of do a check on our syllabus to kind of de, let me not do that, decolonize our syllabus to make sure that it reflects the, you know, the work of Black, Indigenous, people of color, and other marginalized groups, um, and to make sure we have, you know, updated readings. I don't know if, you know, some, don't get me wrong, sometimes in law school, you, you'll, you assign an article, and it'll be from, like, 2000, <laughs> and the students will be like, <laughs> a good article it has all the basics there and then we'll assign something more up to date mm -hmm. um so also constantly reading right a lot of times for my family um i'm a first gen lawyer they're like you're still always reading and it's like yes right it's like, in order to do the political edu the political education work and really have a good sense of what um the client is facing even though i'm a person of color and i I face some similar situations. I never want to oversubscribe. And I'm always really curious because now that I've been out of, I mean, I, I supervise the student practice, but I haven't been in full-time practice for, for a while now, to 15 years. So for me, it's really important to keep abreast of what folks are experiencing on, lawyers are experiencing on the ground in their work and make sure that I'm incorporating it into our um, coursework and our client work so that students are ready and prepared to do the work when they graduate with public interest and social justice lawyers um, out in the field. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for that. Um, definitely, definitely took a, a couple of notes. And yeah, um, yeah, you know, one of the things that's been coming up a lot um, in conversations we had with folks here in DC is, is how do we, particularly for, for, for Black folks um, who, in my experience, don't necessarily make up the majority of, of worker owners and worker cooperatives, you know, a lot of it is how do we just educate folks about this 
alternative. And, and we're going to shift to solidarity economy stuff more specifically in a minute, but I wanted to spend a little bit of time on movement learning. And so, um, yeah, I think constantly reading and, you know, I've even gone outside and just been reading just around, uh, around my block and, and talking to folks about things that, that I've been reading and engaging in group study, which has been, been really helpful. So I um, so appreciate your offerings. Um, so I wanna, I wanna maybe ask one, maybe last question on this theme of, of movement lawyering before we switch to more solidarity economy related questions. And this is jumping off of your, your clinical work. You know, what have been some of the elements of movement lawyering that your students have struggled with the most? Um, and, and how do you, when you identify those challenges, how do you help them move through them? I think sometimes, to be candid, um, students will struggle with their assumptions and their perceptions, and they will want answers. And at times, it's it's not something, it's not a question for us to ask. So for example, in all presentations regarding cooperatives, we go over the immigration issues. Well, we at no time ask people what their status is. And that can make some students feel uncomfortable. Um, some students can even, although I've, this has mainly been when we've co-counseled, mm. um, some people will even question whether it's ethical um, and it is, and we have an ethics opinion. Um, but still, even with that, feel uncomfortable with the fact that folks are not documented. And then that's where a, a different version of political education comes in and, and we're like, okay, everybody deserves a right to be able to provide for themselves and their family. And people are here and people need to work. And um, there's not an obligation for us to ask their status. So we don't need to do that. Um, and if people are really uh, adverse to practicing in that way, then they shouldn't be co-counsel. Um, and if it's for the student, I think we 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 have more and we have more of an opportunity to have several conversations. And um, but ultimately, if a if a student really felt uncomfortable after we tried, similar to being client centered, also student centered find them a project that they're most comfortable with because the last thing is for the student's interest, but it's also for the client's interest because mm -hmm. the last thing the client wants is someone who doesn't think that they should be able to do what they want to do. Um, so those are just kind of honest, hard conversations that we have, but they're necessary and um, I happen not to be conflict adverse. Um, so it's like, you know, to me, it's not that I, people used to say, well, do you love conflict? I'm like, no, I don't love conflict, but I have found conflict to be generative. And within the conflict, really being able to understand more why people feel a strong way in a certain way or why they feel a different way. And then in terms of this decision-making process, everybody taking that into account. So I think conflict can be harnessed and used um, for, the better, for a better outcome for the client. Totally agree, totally agree, totally agree. And sometimes I think too, there's a tendency to just get comfortable um, in the sense that avoiding conflict allows the status quo to continue, right? Like not pushing the boundaries allows for exploitative practices that are normalized. I worked at a law firm for three and a half years. <laughs> like behaviors that are normalized in, in all sorts of spaces. And so being able to move through conflict. And I think to, to the earlier point that you were mentioning before, like having these conversations early, like what does conflict look like? How can I make sure that people feel good about conflict? Like what do you need in terms of communicating without, without coddling people in a way that sometimes is a result of power dynamics? Right, um, but yeah, being able to, to, to move through that is, is, is so key. And you, you touched on a point, I'm, I'm gonna shift now a little bit to more solidarity economy stuff. And I, 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 it was gonna be my third question, but I gotta, I gotta go into it now. But you know, many of the laws on the books are like, little, they're, just, they're either designed to like allow for the exploitation of workers or they just do not contemplate the type of world that this movement is trying to create. And so I, like, how do you, 
like, how do you navigate that? Like, how have you navigated issues around like corporate law? I mean, you mentioned immigration law, but even like securities law, when you talk about financing and people maybe having different types of honor statuses uh, and, and sort of like financing in general, where you have all these ways in which the law really doesn't want us to be great. And we'll, we'll, love, we'll love your thoughts on that. Um, I think that we are always trying to push the envelope as far as possible or walk the line without crossing it um, in order to get our clients the resources that they need. And in terms of corporate law, the, the, the example that came to mind is that, you know, with corporate lawyers, and it, it's not a wrong thing, um, but when I, especially early on, when I would co-counsel with corporate lawyers, and we would do something like bylaws, the basic governance document, there was a lot of broad language in it. And we would say, okay, no, the client actually wants to delineate what the rights are and what the responsibilities are. And um, some of our colleagues would be like, well, no, you wanna give the client the most flexibility possible. And I was like, that's true for your client in terms of your typical corporation. That is not true for our client right now who is not coming from a place of having traditionally been in power. So they wanna make sure that their power is embedded in their governance structure. And this is how we're gonna do it. Um, to leave it vague or to leave it ambiguous, it actually does not work in our client's interest. Um, so, you know, making sure that the advice is tailored for the client um, that you're working with becomes really important. Yeah. Um, yeah. No, it's um, so many, so many struggles in, in, in doing this work. And I, and I appreciate just the very practical strategies that you're offering and also just the examples of, of, how, of how things have come up and how you've navigated them. Um, so I'm going to start sprinkling in, sprinkle, sprinkle some of the questions from the audience. And, and I've got, I could ask you questions all day. So I want to make sure to, to bring in some questions from, from the audience as well. And so the first one that I'm going to ask is, and this is related to a conversation you and I were having earlier, just around um, client needs and wants and the way the lawyer shows up. Sometimes the clients want the lawyer to take the lead, but will occasionally blame the lawyer for the decision choice. How can that be avoided? Or how have you navigated that in your, in your practice? For me, um, you know, it, it, in, in, in our practice area, when the client wants me to take the lead, um, I usually say that to the client, I give this example. I know I get frustrated when I go to a doctor and I ask for the doctor's opinion and the doctor's like, well, you know, you're the one that has to live with it. So you have to make the decision. It doesn't feel very helpful. So what I say to people is like, well, why don't you, we, I can walk you through um, the decision-making process and let's talk about what your values are. And I could give you an example of how I would, you, you know, because my decision would be based on my own value set. Um, and we can walk through the decision-making process that really kind of surfaces what the client's value set is and how things need to move, need to move forward. Um, but because they really do, this part does echo the, the doctor scenario, because they, they are the ones who have to live with the, with the outcome, they need to be invested in the um, in, in what's decided as the outcome. And sometimes, like something, an example would be, sorry to keep going back to the commercial leases, I hope no one is offended, but um, in that case, it was, it was fine for the lawyers to take the lead. Um, so long as they knew what the clients wanted. And then, like I said before, in other cases like governance matters, um, the lawyer should definitely not take the lead. And if, I think that the answer can also change depending on if it's a kind of startup organization or um, a long-standing partner. 
with a long-standing partner, um, I think there are parts, again, that even a social justice warrior could take the lead on with the direction of um, the client. Because I do, I don't know who asked the question, but I do understand that, you know, for, for people who have money and they pay for their lawyer, their lawyer never turns around and says to them, well, this is the part you have to do, right? So that's also why we work with organizers because we know that they don't want us to take the lead. So that's another way to kind of protect against that. Um, oh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, definitely been in those situations as well. And I think, yeah, what you outlined in terms of I'm um, just making sure, you know, to engage other the other folks who are involved, whether it's the organizers, um, but also, um, you know, asking the questions and kind of getting the information uh, makes makes a lot of sense to, to me. So that that question was from Mark. And I'm now going to shift to another question. And this is from um, Quinn Walcott. Hey, Q, what's going on? Um, I was wondering if this form of movement lawyering is pro bono or is this coming solely from the law school clinics? As I know, many traditional movement lawyers are developed based on the need of that particular organization, movement, and sometimes out of its membership. And they struggle to financially to follow through on the cost of these cases just, and, and just to survive personally. All that to say, how many of the students or new lawyers remain in this work if they themselves are not homegrown politically or connected to an organization? Um. So at, at CUNY, the, the last report we saw, more than 60% of our graduates go into public interest work. Um, and in terms of the work of cooperative work in particular, um, I would say a third of the folks graduating out of the CED clinic um, continue to do this work. Um, we have alums at Take Root. Um, where Julian used to be at, we had an alum at ICA, we had a, an alum at Rutgers um, working for ESOPs. So there, there are many different um, venues that, or employment statuses that our alums have that are connected to cooperatives, including um, one alum who, Senator Jamal Bailey, he has passed a lot of legislation on worker co-ops and he first became interested in worker co-ops in law school. Um, so we, we have our folks kind of scattered throughout um, and it's growing and it's great to see people in different places and, 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 and try to come back together and say, you know, how can we collaborate and do more of this work intentionally, especially now that we have more people doing it. Um, but I do think that it's hard and, and that it's even for nonprofits who want to incubate co-ops. Um, in terms of thinking about the resources they would need in order to um, incubate the worker co-ops and how that you know balances or takes away from their other work. And depending on the co-op, you know, we would actually advise them to not incubate and have it be separate if there's, if there's a significant amount of, of liability that could come from it, um, from the type of co-op that it's going to be. So we are seeing more and more lawyers interested, including the National Lawyers Guild and more corporate attorneys wanting to do um, pro bono work with us. So there is a lot of pro bono work being done, but there's also more and more nonprofits and nonprofit legal firms that are doing the work as well. So there's SELC, S-E-L-C in California. Um, and there's a, there's a number of uh, the Urban Justice Center, Take Root. Um, I know a lot of New York organizations, so I'm trying not to do the naming and leave anyone out, but those Selkids from California, Northern Manhattan Improvement Corporation. But it, when I, I don't want to age myself, but when I first started, there was only one um, legal organization with a community and economic development, and it was actually called the Community Development Project. Um, and that was Brooklyn Legal Services Corp A. And then when I was in law school, maybe two, the Legal Aid Society um, opened one, one unit to do CED work as well. And now almost every uh, Legal Aid has a CED unit within it. 
and there's also legal nonprofits um, that are doing the work as well. And yeah, including legal services of Staten Island. Yeah. And it just still feels like there just aren't enough. <laughs> yeah, no, there you know, is. You know, it's only been a couple of couple of years where mm -hmm. I I really before when people would ask the question, I was like, well, we don't really turn anyone away. And in the last couple of years, we don't turn people away, but we find ourselves saying we're at capacity and then we're scrambling to find other attorneys who also are not at capacity to do the work. So I feel like we're definitely at um, a point where we need more and more lawyers doing this work. Um, I think it's, you know, it is a, the same thing for law school clinics has just been in the last couple of years where we've seen a real growth in um, CED clinics. So. Yeah, and speaking of the, the law firm folks who want to do pro bono work, that, that's how you and I met. I was at the firm and I had read Collective Courage by Jessica Gordon Emhard and was like, oh my goodness, this is the work that I need to do. And when I did a survey of the clinics in New York, even New York City, which you would think given that it was the first city to have funding for New York, uh, for a worker cooperative ecosystem in the country back in what was it, 2014, I believe, 2013, 2014. Really, your clinic was really the only one that I saw that explicitly said we do stuff around worker cooperatives. And by the time I left New York last year, you know, I know they were doing stuff at, at a couple of the other law schools as well. So definitely resonates with me. And there are some for-profit um, smaller law firms that I know are sort of doing some work in this space. Um, some of it pays, some of it not. And so, you know, but it's, yeah, there, there definitely could be more uh, of this work. And so I'm going to take one more question and I'll ask a couple other questions. I think this is the last one. We, oh, we got a comment from, from Katisha, one, one of my former colleagues. And this was just around you know, there's also like cult cultural competency that needs to be taken into account as well, uh, particularly on the conversation around taking the lead. You know, it can mean, you know, explaining things in lay terms to really empower clients um, to, make, to make decisions. So sort of being client-centered in a way that um, also is accessible because there's ways in which you could be like, well, you know, they don't understand it. So, you know, they need to make a decision. And, and sometimes it's really about, well, did we give them the information in ways that are accessible? Did we make sure that they understood enough in different ways? Do we know them well enough? But we know, oh, this person's visual. All right, this person likes to kind of have a live conversation and go back and forth. Like that's how they process information so that they can make an informed decision. I think sometimes noticing the difference between the two is, is, is an important skill that sometimes gets, gets lost on folks. So thank you, Katisha. Uh, for lifting that up. I don't know if you had any responses, Carmen, to, to oh, that I question. Say, yeah, thank you for bringing them up because I think it is so important. And especially when, you know, it's easy to, for folks sometimes to say, oh, it's just, it's so complex, they just don't get it. And, but like Julian said, and maybe you said too in your comment, it's more about, well, how many times have we tried to explain it and have we explained it in different ways, not only verbally, but maybe we're looking at visual learners and what are the different ways that we are communicating. And even something is, to me, my first year of lawyering, I made the mistake of getting in front of a group and saying, you know, okay, so corporation is like a person. <laughs> That's what I was learning in school and everyone's face just dropped. And I was like, Okay, let, let me back up. So they're really not like a person and that's how we're, we're taught to describe it, but I'm gonna back up and try to do it again if I can. <laughs> and people tend to be gracious, right? When you mess up, but, um, but again, that was an instance where I should have actually known better because I knew that that was a workers' rights and, um, organization and corporations are in fact not people, despite what the law says. Um, so making sure that we're, we don't get caught in our jargon and in the language that we feel most comfortable with at times is also really important. And not to discount what people are able to um, take in. Um, mm -hmm. because someone else can explain it. And, and in that way, also to kind of, what I say to my colleagues is like, I'm always willing to check my ego at the door. If there's someone that can explain it better than me, I'm happy to hear it from them and also learn it 
from them as well. Um, because we all can't reach everyone, but we all need to try to make sure that the information we're trying to get across is getting across and not say that, oh, well, it can't get across because the person just doesn't get it. Um, making sure we exhaust all methods before doing something like that. Yeah, for sure, um, for sure. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna ask a, a question. We have two questions in the queue. And so uh, Tamar and John, we're definitely gonna get to your questions. So thank you. And if other people have questions, please, please um, throw them in the Q&A function and, and I'll make sure to make sure we ask all of the questions you all have before I, I do the rest of my questions. So I wanted to touch on this because you brought it up around the anchor project you're working on that centers this hospital. Just thinking about it, this is not just about health, it's also about wealth. I want to also ask sort of, in what ways do you see solidarity economy work as beyond wealth generation even, and really as like this movement toward, you know, an alternative economic system um, altogether? Because I think there's ways in which in certain spaces you could kind of see conversations going around the lines of like, how do we maybe do capitalism in a way that's like centering profit sharing, right? And, and so like that's, that's like, that's the goal and cooperatives are like the way to, to get there. And so like, how do we, or how do you think about this is really something that's, that's bigger than that. And sort of what kind of ways have you, have you navigated that yourself or, or in conversations with, with other folks? I think solidarity definitely goes beyond well. And, and I am deeply committed to wealth creation, especially within, um, by our communities. And at the same time, you know, some, it's not about getting rich. So with the Mondragon model, um, even though it does exceptionally well, no one's really wealthy. People are just comfortable, very comfortable, but they're not wealthy. Um, and I think a lot of times for the solidarity economy, we're not thinking about capital and wealth in that context. We're thinking about care and meeting each other's human needs. And that could be in the form of mutual aid societies or other forms of um, solidarity. And I, and I think even, I'm not sure who said it earlier, but our communities have been engaged in all of this kind of work without the label, right? So for me, it's like the woman who used to sell the limbe ice cream outside of her you know, first floor window, we went and bought from her because we knew she needed the money. Um, and the ICs were good. And, um, or, you know, people having card parties or rent parties. I mean, when you're poor, you get creative because you have to make, you know, you have to make things happen. So I, I think it's not, you know, sometimes it's not about creating wealth, but it's about making sure there's someone to watch your child that you feel comfortable with um, and you feel like your child is safe with. Sometimes it's about, you know, the mutual aid in terms, especially during the pandemic with like PPE and food and so many people being unemployed and delivering food or packaging food for people. Like that's, you're, you're not gonna build wealth off of that or get profit off of that, but you are gonna meet human needs through that. And I think that's very much the heart of the solidarity economy. Um, so I don't think it's always about making money, but because we have to live and we live in a capitalist society, we need enough money to survive. And then there can be things that happen aside with um, capitalism. And then there's things that we're trying to do to dismantle capitalism altogether. Um, so I, I think there's a spectrum there. And I, I think it's important to think about, you know, that's why we work, right? I mean, that's why most workers work. You work so you could be able to pay your rent, so you could be able to put food on your table. So you could be able to go out sometimes and have a good time. The, 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 the purpose of the money is to live and not just to accumulate, uh, except in a capitalist system where we see people just accumulate and accumulate is greed in my opinion. And they sit on their money and we have all this suffering, human suffering. To me, that's unconscionable. Um, and it's definitely something the law lifts up because of course the law is designed to protect the privileged. Um, so sometimes I feel like I used to love puzzles as a kid. And sometimes I feel like I'm playing with the puzzle with the, the one that had all the moving parts, you shift one and you have to keep moving. 
um, because we're having to find, you know, it's not just setting up the um, co-op, but it's also helping them find funding. It's also helping them find additional resources. So it's really about trying to bring the pieces together and um, have communities feel whole. And by whole, I don't mean missing in terms of people. I mean, missing in terms of neighborhood institutions. There are, even in New York City, there are food deserts, which, I mean, there, there really is no, there's no reasonable explanation for that except greed in our capitalist system. Um, so, yeah. Yeah, and, and the suffering, I, I think that's just a, a really apt way of putting it because that's, you know, really what, what, what's going on is, is folks are suffering um, in ways that are seen and I think in ways that are oftentimes unseen, sometimes willingly, sometimes unwillingly. And that's really what's at stake. You know, do we want a world where people, the majority of people are going to be suffering? Or do we want a world where people feel like they belong and, and can, like you said, have their material needs met? Maybe there's no property ownership such that there's rent at all, right? You know, so, you know, one day. Sorry, <laughs> you always say, I might be the only lawyer who doesn't believe in private property. I don't own anything. No, um, I, but I am willing to think about collectively owning something. I've shifted a little bit. Okay, okay. I, ooh, I wanna talk about that uh, for sure. Uh, so I'm gonna, so just because this question, it's the second question, but because it's so related to what we just asked, I'm gonna ask John's question. Okay. So John Willow, thanks so much for this conversation. Um, can you talk a bit about how you see the future of this work? So lawyering and support of worker cooperatives and more broadly, let me make the question shifted. Oh, and more broadly, the solidarity economy movement. Given our current political context of rising social movements, particularly around racial and economic justice, are you optimistic that we're moving in the right direction and that worker cooperatives can play a prominent role in progressive radical social change? I think in terms of where I see this work going, there's a lot of talk about scale. I even mentioned it today, but I don't necessarily think of scale as getting to the biggest that you can be. Um, I think you can scale horizontally and have a whole bunch of businesses, you know, sprout up and that that's important. I also think that there is um, a growing need for CD and mediation um, because as the co-ops have grown, you know, with growth, there's, there, there's always conflict. Um, yes. Having those designs up front, I had a friend, John will appreciate this, he's a both of our friends. Um, he used to say, the best time to fix the roof is when the sun is shining. So now we are trying to do that on the front end, designing the, um, you know, the, the mediation techniques that people go through it, as opposed to suing each other or a member suing the co-op when they leave. Um, because there is more of that happening now that there's growth in the community. And in terms of racial justice, um, really hard for me to be um, I'll put it this way. I think that the only way we are going to get more where we can achieve more racial justice is through collective ownership. The organizing to me is a given, um, but collective ownership and through the solidarity economy, um, because we, we're still seeing the same reports, right? Like it's, it takes this much money to live in a two bedroom apartment throughout the US and like half, half US citizens or US population doesn't make that amount of money. Home ownership that used to be kind of a, a way in or a way up um, is also on the decline in um, communities of color. And I, and I think that we do need to, um, that's why I wanna focus in on wealth as a way, as, a, as an access tool, um, but not as a way to, again, not just to create another, you know, rich person of color. It's more, that's where the political education comes into play. Um, I think, and I'm, I'm gonna mess up this person's name because I don't really follow people's Leandra. I think she's a young actress. 
she just she she did a movie she um she gave all of the people on her set or team one percent um and then it sold to netflix and so everybody got like three hundred and thirty thousand dollars. thinking of different ways in which we can actually help people and um do better and have assets um to work from because i, I feel like there's so much rhetoric around racial justice that I think more of us, especially those of us who are doing the work, need to continue doing the work and then kind of um, share our best practices with each other so that more and more people can actually benefit from them. And I think it's, what is the saying? Um, pessimism of the mind, optimism of the will is what I would respond to John. Awesome, thank you, thank you for that. Yeah, uh, so I asked for more questions and look at here, we have so many questions. So let me let me kind of roll through these. So uh, from Tamar Hoffman, how can we as law students, legal workers, lawyers, organizers, et cetera, organize ourselves in cooperative structures in addition to supporting other groups who are trying to move in that direction? So, you know, in in Mondragon, which is insane, their, their school, their college is actually a co-op itself. Um, I imagine that it would be really, doesn't mean, I'm, I'm not a dream killer. It does not mean that we can't see it happen. Um, but ideally, particularly for public institutions, um, <clears throat> CUNY, uh, it would be great <laughs> if there was more of that type of model where the faculty and the students um, actually own own the the school in which they they attend or work in, um, and then I also think that there are lots of nonprofits that are exploring different ways of, even though they're not a worker co-op, but taking cooperative principles and working them into their decision making process and and their governance. Um, so I, I think that is a way to do it. If you if you're still a student in terms of your, your student clubs and activities, particularly student clubs, running your clubs um, in a cooperative way. I think the exercise in collaborative decision-making is a lifelong skill um, and is a, it's, it's worthwhile even without the politics attached. And um, again, I, I guess I just wanted to say, you know, some people will say, well, you know, the more people at the decision-making table, the harder it is to reach the decision, but a lot of corporations have like 15 people on their board and things like that. So I would just say, like, kind of question why it is that's the assumption um, and think more about how it is that you share power with people and what kind of power you want to have and what kind of power you want other people to be able to exercise um, and under what kind of circumstances um, to do that. But I do think it's, it's you know, it's, it would, I actually, uh, was thinking about this in my clinic um, to start to function as a cooperative, mm. as a way to get a sense of what it is, it, you know, more of a first person experience, even though we're kind of privileged, so it, it's still different. Um, but for me, it, it just gives you more insight into that human dynamic of being able to um, collaboratively work with people and not have the final say. So. For example, even as the director of the Community and Economic Development Clinic at um, CUNY, I do not have the final say. Or, you know, I mean, I don't know, people can't respond, but um, at least that's not how I present it. It's like, and I have actually gone against myself. <laughs> if the group is all on one page um, and convinced me that, oh, I didn't see that. Um, we move, but we're also like five people. So I think it gets, it does get harder when there's more people, but I think, you know, experimenting with that type of decision-making can only be helpful. Yeah, no, I, I love that. Like engaging in the practice, engaging in the practice where you can. I mean, study circles are cooperative things that you can sort of put together. I think it allows you to engage in the political education piece and sharpening your analysis. You know, if there are mutual aid efforts that are going on in the cities where you live, 
um, just kind of, yeah, just getting into the practice <laughs> of, of trying sort of the, the aspects of cooperatives that aren't tied to profit, it's like the profit and sort of the dividends being based on people's work is just, that's just one element. But like, like Carmen mentioned, it's also the decision-making. How do you share power? How do you, um, yeah, how do you share power? So we got a couple other questions and we got plenty of time. So this is, this is good. So let's go um, to Tatiana Lima. Hey, what's going on? Uh, what are some pathways towards transitioning into this work from a totally different practice area? So I will say that when I, I actually was exposed to this work when I was at Fordham Law School and um, my mentor, and friend now used to say, don't, don't let the complexity and the wide range of law involved in the area prevent you from doing the work. You can, you know, all of the skills that we learn in law school are transferable. So we can take those skills that we have and apply them in a new setting. And with some political education and um, some mentoring and, at least when I was kind of coming up, it was a lot of peer mentoring because there weren't a lot of CED lawyers. Um, so I really think that anybody who's interested in this work can do the work. And I feel like if you reach out to someone who's in the field and you express a genuine interest, that they will in fact, including me, you can reach out to me, um, will take the time to talk to you about the nature of the work and how to get into the work. Um, you know, Julian had mentioned that he reached out to me, um, someone named Gary Krishna um, had also reached out to me. And I remember her saying, thank you for taking a cold call. And I was like, oh, I was happy to, <laughs> and same with Julian. I was like, I was more than happy to take that call, trust <laughs> me. And I think sometimes we think other people are so busy that we're like, mm, maybe we won't fault that person. But I think this is a field where people are welcoming and people really we know we need more lawyers doing this work. Um, and that's, that's not to say that sometimes there aren't issues of you know, competition, but or, or mainly because of funding. But for the most part, the lawyers themselves, they're like they're the CED lister of this chair of the best practices and um, really trying to come together, kind of create our own movement of lawyers who are doing this work. So there's definitely openings and people that you can reach out to to get interested. Yeah, um, and I think, you know, there, there's some good organizations where you can even just start learning some things now that have some really good resources that are lawyer centric. And so like Samuel Economies Law Center, which was mentioned before, Democracy at Work Institute has some really good materials online, the ICA group, which Carmen mentioned earlier. And I think a second thing is really tapping in to the co-op space in your in your city, right? And so one of the things I did after I connected with Carmen was Carmen was like, oh, there's this thing called the New York City Network of Worker Cooperatives or NICNOC, which is kind of like the membership organization for worker cooperatives in, in New York. She so, said, you know, you should check out their listserv. And I started to go to fundraisers. I went to teach, I went to trainings. I went to the cooperative conference. And so when Take Root was finally hiring maybe a year after I contacted Carmen, they're like, oh, this isn't like that bald black guy, the corporate guy who we see all the time, who's just like around. And I knew like three of the four people who were interviewing me. So I think part of it too is just like showing up and finding ways to show up, um, depending on what the ecosystem is like in your in your respective town or city. So we got another question from James Smith, one of my law school classmates. Hey, what is the biggest value add? corporate workforces, including corporate law departments, can deliver to further the objectives of small community-focused economic development efforts. How would you think about organizing and mobilizing such a corporate effort? And I've been seeing more and more of a need for corporate um, pro bono counsel. And just as our clients grow, their needs grow and their legal needs grow as well. And it's hard to kind of, I mean, the union co-op, for example, is something that we, I did not have the expertise in, but I was willing to kind of learn as we went with, with the clinic and the client. Um, but there are some things that I just don't think that that would be wise. For example, 
intellectual property. We have so many more um, cooperative clients coming to us for help with intellectual property um, that we don't have the experience in-house for. Um, so that's definitely one area. And even with some of the more uh, complicated corporate, especially around taxes, um, or I can say the more complicated corporate matters, uh, we could definitely use uh, pro bono counsel and help with and um, just really making sure that, you know, for example, something as, something as simple as we did a governance document we were like, okay, we believe in, in language justice. We are going to translate this into Spanish. The law firm said to us, you cannot do that. And we're like, what, why? And they were like, because that document as a legal document in Spanish, you don't know if you've actually captured the right terminology and concepts for that document. So things like that. And then we, so we did like an informal kind of pamphlet to explain the the actual legal document, but there are some things that are like kind of really in the weeds for us as um, educators that corporate counsel is really good at spotting and saying, okay, you really should be thinking about this. And then in terms of, you know, a tax analysis or even in terms of evaluation of the company, um, you know, a lot of people don't go into this because they have a business background, they go into it for the other reasons. So we really do need the we really do do need the lawyers that understand business law really well and understand how business businesses operate um, to kind of help guide. Or else it just takes us longer to do it. But um, I think with more pro bono help, we could actually service more folks or work with more folks. Yeah, and I think also just in thinking about our, our practice, like we have folks do memos, just like very discreet questions around what are the possibilities for creativity around distributions of dividends to founders, right? That is different from just a work on it. Because a lot of times founders are like, I did the work okay. and I should be entitled to more. So we just had someone, a law firm, do a, a very discreet memo um, on that. I have done some collaborative pro bono work with corporate law departments, but it seems like in most of those instances, like when, when you're talking about like in-house folks, like there's someone on the inside who just kind of takes the initiative. And I think like Carmen said, I mean, there'll be plenty of organizations who you could probably line up to, to be open to, to working with you and, and, doing, and doing that work. It's just not super common. And you know, it's, I think for folks like you who who want to delve more into that and get your organization to do that, I think there are more than a few opportunities to to do it. So, um, cool, cool, cool. So we have a comment from Monica Sanders. I just wanted to thank you so much for this conversation. I'm applying to law school this fall, and I'm keenly interested in movement lawyering, but struggle to find information about it. Thank you. So there's the, um, and now I'm going to confuse them. There, there's the, there's law at the margins, which a colleague of, a colleague of mine operates. Um, and there's also um, movement lawyering bootcamp that would be a good place to kind of start along with DAWI and the other organizations that Julian mentioned. Yeah, and I think is the movement lawyer bootcamp is that separate from movement law lab or are those the same? Yeah. Okay. Yeah, and I did the I would I kind of helped out with the the one that they did last year. So definitely, and and the really good thing about that bootcamp is, at least when they did it last year, there were parts of the sessions that included actual organizers who were talking about like this <laughs> this is what we need, this is what we don't need, and so I think it's also very it's just helpful to not be in an echo chamber of lawyers and to really hear what folks who are on the ground doing the organizing, building relationships with community members, um, see for the role of, of lawyers and, and to, to really be responsive to that. So, so, so I, I definitely agree with that, that recommendation as well. 
So I'm gonna ask one more question before I say a few final things before I hand it over to Mark. And you can go wherever you wanna go with this. And the question is like, who, who inspires you? You know, when you, when you think about the work is, you know, organizations, lawyers, organizers, who, who inspires you um, these days that, that maybe folks should be, be thinking about? And I guess the second question is a cheat, it's a double question. Is yeah, like what, um, what is your vision for the future? Uh, what, what's the vision that informs the work that you do and how is it informed by community? For me, I mean, I think there, there are so many people that inspire me, um, but it really is clients who are coming together who identify a need in their own community um, that have a vision and want to see it through um, always energizes me. And also colleagues who are in this field doing the work um, also inspire me and keep me going. And, and students, and the, the whole, you know, the, the union co-op docket that we created was really student-led. Um, so I, I feel like there's always all this creative energy, which I really appreciate. And there's no shortage of brilliant ideas coming from community residents. Um, there's just a shortage of financing. Um, and I feel like the same is true with many of our students. And many of our students have um, non-traditional backgrounds. Many of them used to be organizers themselves. So they too come in and often kind of help with understanding that complexity of the lawyer organizer relationship. And, um, you know, and, and of course the people who, who mentor and have mentored me throughout my career, um, I definitely appreciate and I'm inspired by. You know, my vision for the future is really to make sure that more Black-led um, cooperatives or people of color-led cooperatives are supported. Supported by lawyers, supported by philanthropists, and supported by banks. Um, and if they can't be supported by banks, we create our own public banks that's that's pretty much my vision. Um, the I am probably going to. Actually, I didn't realize I was I was about to choke up a little bit. I'm actually probably going to transition soon from being the director of the clinic to being the dean of the clinic. So I won't have the, I won't be fully immersed. And then I guess the reason why I'm kind of tearing up a little bit because I feel like it puts me more. Another is like kind of step back from the community, but my vision is to really support all my wonderful colleagues who are doing the work and making sure they have the resources to do the work. And of course, once in a while, being able to join in on a project or two, if they let me. Um, but really wanting to see more of our law students, and even if it's not cooperative, just really graduate with a sense of no matter what kind of law you do, the way you practice law, similar to doctors, try to do the least amount of harm to the people you come into contact with, even if they're not your client. Um, and for me, that's really the focus is on ethical representation. And, you know, and I'm also glad that all those years ago, they, in some ways, they took out zealous representation in New York. Um, and I think that for a lot of for-profit lawyers that meant more like being a hired gun. But for public interest lawyers, I felt like it was a good reminder that no matter who's paying you, you still have a duty and zealous representation is owed. And the last thing you want to do is reinforce any of the negative power dynamics that our clients already face when they are dealing with oppressive systems. The last thing I want to see us do is replicate that feeling or that experience for them. Well, Carmen, thank you so much. It's all, always always good to, to, to chat with you. I uh, appreciate the vulnerability, the authenticity, the, the, the gems that you've dropped for us. Um, hopefully folks you know, are leaving this conversation with a grounding in movement lawyering, a grounding in solidarity economies and sort of the intersections. And so um, I'm gonna pass over to Mark to close us out. Thank you. Wow. 
this was an outstanding conversation. Thank you so much, Carmen. Thank you so much, Julian. I tell you, movement lawyering has been a question that when I speak to students, they uh, want to know, well, what does it mean to be a movement lawyer? Uh, I look at it from the perspective of having had a whole career as a union side labor lawyer. And it's approaching a relationship with your client as a team. You all have a problem that you're trying to, to, to figure out and you're working on it together and you're bringing your expertise in uh, along with the desires of your client. Um, thank you so much for such a great conversation. Um, in closing, um, uh, I, I wanna thank the audience for attending this session. We hope you found it informative and, and helpful in, in your counsel and advocacy. And those of you who are thinking about law school, you got something more to think about. Uh, planning is in the works for a June segment, so stay tuned. In the meantime, we wish you success in your community endeavors and a quest for knowledge. Have a safe and enjoyable holiday weekend.